What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you solo today to bring you the Week 15 Wide Receiver Rankings. As I talked about yesterday, we have made it. We are here. It is fantasy playoff time. It is crunch time. We have to be sharp on our decision-making. And to do that, we need to know all the usage, all the trends, the matchups that we're talking about this week. And I will be covering all of that today for you guys. So if you guys do enjoy this video at any point, please hit the like button. It helps us grow. It helps us out tremendously. It doesn't cost you anything as well. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Comment any of your thoughts down below. And if you guys are interested in supporting us, you can now become a member of the channel by hitting the join button when you go to youtube.com forward slash the fantasy stock exchange. But without further ado, let's hit the intro and then we'll get right into this. Okay, so as always, these are the wide receiver matchups on the screen. Again, I will leave these on the screen throughout the duration of the video so you can make reference to them as I go through and as I you know, talk about each game, you can see, okay, he's talking about Brandon Cooks right now. I can see that he has the Jacksonville Jaguars, which is the best matchup on the week. Or if I'm talking about DJ Moore, Michael Pittman, you guys can see that they have more uh, difficult matchups this week. So let's start with the top eight wide receivers. In today's video, I'm going to cover wide receivers one to 24 in depth. Also going to talk about wide receivers uh, 26 to 32. Any wide receivers that I don't talk about in today's video, you guys can check out where I have them ranked in the description right now. If you guys go down there, it should say week 15 rankings here. And you can click on that and see where I have, you know, AJ Green ranked. If I didn't talk about AJ Green in this video and you need to know who you should start him over, you can just check out the rankings totally free to do so there. So wide receiver one on the week is Devontae Adams for me. He is my wide receiver one, mainly because the Ravens are completely decimated on the back end. They don't have Marlon Humphrey for the rest of the season. And this game that leaves Anthony Averett, Tavon Young, and uh, Chris Westry as the corners that are going to have to be tasked with stopping Devontae Adams. And he actually had a semi-difficult matchup last week against Jalen Johnson and was still able to produce. Corners with PFF grades on the in the high 50s and low 60s this year are probably not going to be able to hang with Devontae Adams in this game. Again, we might have no Lamar Jackson on the Ravens side of things as well, which means Green Bay is going to be able to dominate the time of possession, dominate the uh, offensive drives that they have, and potentially get some turnovers off of a guy like Tyler Huntley as well. Even if Lamar plays, uh, though, I still like Devontae Adams as my wide receiver one. Number two, Cooper Cup. He had a quiet game against Seattle uh, the first time around. It was actually his worst game pretty much of the entire season outside of the one uh, to Arizona. I don't expect that to happen in this game, though. Ugo Amadi is the slot corner for the Seahawks, and he's allowed an 80% catch rate this season. So this is a guy that uh, is targeted often, and when he's targeted, he allows a lot of catches. And that is not a good recipe for going up against the guy that currently leads the NFL in catches and in targets. So uh, Cooper Cup expected probably to have a pretty big game in this one, and he actually has the the easiest matchup on the field, uh, surprisingly, of all the Seahawks corners. Number three, Justin Jefferson. He is coming fresh off of a 15-target game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, no qualms throwing him into my lineup, of course, against the defense that wasn't able to stop Devontae Adams. Now he will see the same exact matchup that Devontae Adams saw against Jalen Johnson in shadow coverage, who's been pretty good this year, but uh, Devontae Adams was just a good enough receiver to take advantage. And I think Justin Jefferson uh, pretty much profiles as the same type of receiver ability to separate pretty easily against a guy like Jalen Johnson. Debo Samuel, uh, is the wide receiver four for me on the week. The first actual analysis really have to give because I think those first three were self-explanatory, but AJ Terrell is expected to line up across from Brandon Ayuk for the most part, which frees up Debo Samuel to do damage in this game. The big factor for me is does Elijah Mitchell play? Because if Elijah Mitchell plays, then we know that Debo Samuel is probably going to be running more routes. He's going to be out there more as a wide receiver, which was what we want to see basically. Debo's target share has seen a big downtick since Elijah Mitchell has been banged up, they've been using Debo Samuel on the ground, giving him five, six, seven, eight carries a game. And that's not really what we want out of Debo Samuel. We like when he gets touches on the ground, but we also want him to get targets. And he hasn't had a lot of targets over the past four games. It's mainly been George Kittle, and it's mainly been Brandon Ayuk doing it in the passing game with Debo contributing with explosive runs here and there. Of course, again, we do like that about Debo Samuel, but we want him to also be getting targets as well as most of us play in PPR leagues. 
Wide receiver five on the week, Tyreek Hill. I don't need to convince you to start Tyreek Hill. I'm sure you guys know that, but I would, if you're worried about him at all, just throw out last week's performance. They killed the Raiders. It was due to defensive touchdowns. It was due to the fact that they were able to run all over that team. And, and that team is just a run funnel defense in general. They're very good against the pass and they're very bad against the run. So it makes for a lot of teams game planning to, to run the ball against the Las Vegas Raiders. And I guess you could say the same about the Los Angeles Chargers as well. But the difference being that the Chargers are going to put up points on the Chiefs defense, most likely, and the uh, the Chiefs aren't going to just be able to uh, run the ball down their throat and win the game handedly because the Chargers are probably going to put up points on the other end. Tyreek Hill is expected to see um, Tyson Campbell in coverage, who's allowing a 74% catch percentage this year. Anytime he goes in the slot, he'll be against Chris Harris Jr., who's a little bit more of a tougher matchup. But uh, ironically, usually when we see Tyreek Hill's matchup chart, he has the better matchup advantage against the slot corner when he goes into the slot versus when he's on the outside. But in this game, could do his damage from the outside. And hell, that might mean he uh, catches a long bomb touchdown or something for the first time pretty much all season. I don't know if he's caught a long touchdown this year yet. And uh, Keenan Allen, my wide receiver six in the exact same game, of course, happening tonight as I record this on Thursday. He was activated off the COVID list yesterday and he is expected to play. Five of six games with 10 plus targets before last week's absence due to COVID-19. Keenan Allen, a guy that you're absolutely firing up in this game. And he also, despite having a pretty tough matchup against Rashad Fenton, who has one of the higher PFF grades of any corner this season, he's still allowed a 71% catch percentage. So Keenan Allen maybe doesn't have a huge play in this game, but a guy that should be able to get it done from the PPR angle, which is what we know that Keenan Allen is known for. And then Mike Williams actually had a very good game against the Kansas City Chiefs last time around. And I'll talk about that when I get to him. Number seven, uh, first of all, I can't believe I'm, I'm you know this late in saying it, but happy fuck the Saints week. Uh, go Bucks, of course. You guys know I'm a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. I dislike uh, no team more than the New Orleans Saints. But Chris Godwin, my wide receiver seven on the week. We know the narrative by now. We know it is actually true too. It's not just a narrative. Chris Godwin is the guy that performs against the New Orleans Saints. And the reason is because Marshawn Lattimore does a good job at, you know, locking down Mike Evans to some extent. I also think to uh, Evans's credit that Tom Brady just doesn't like throwing at Marshawn Lattimore and he will exploit the better matchups on the field, which in this game without Antonio Brown still for another game will be Chris Godwin and it will be Rob Gronkowski might be Leonard Fournette as well in the passing game. So we, we know the song and dance enough to know what to expect eight for 140 and a touchdown in week eight is what Chris Godwin did to the New Orleans Saints uh, the first time that they played this season. So uh, fire Chris Godwin up as a top 10 Wide receiver this week, he is expected to see Chauncey Gardner-Johnson in the slot. 71% catch percentage allowed, 54.6 PFF grade on the season. Fire him up with confidence. Closing out the top eight, we have Stephon Diggs. He is expected to be shadow covered by Stephon Gilmore. Now, I wanted to say, oh, his old friend Stephon Gilmore, because Stephon Diggs was on Buffalo and Stephon Gilmore was on New England, you figured they'd match up. But actually, they never matched up when Stephon Diggs was in Buffalo because Stephon Gilmore missed all three games that they played Buffalo, ironically, two games last year and one game this year. So they did face back in 2018 when Diggs was on Minnesota and he only managed to go five for 49 and zero in that game. So uh, Stephon Gilmore, definitely a tougher matchup for Stephon Diggs. Definitely not ideal for Stephon Diggs. But of course, we know he is a good enough wide receiver to be able to take advantage of matchups like that. So let's get into wide receivers nine through 16. The guys that have a little bit more question marks, but are still pretty locked and loaded into your lineup. Deontay Johnson, my wide receiver nine on the week. Deontay on the surface looks like a smash spot against the Titans, but the Titans corners have actually been fairly decent against wide receivers, all recording respectable coverage grades and his two matchups that he's going to see the most time against. They only have a 50% or less catch percentage allowed. So I, I'm assuming a lot of people are going to fire up Deontay Johnson in DFS this week and think that he's in just an absolute smash spot. But the Titans have actually been a little bit more susceptible to the other positions in the passing game, running back, tight end, et cetera, and slot receivers as well. So I don't think Deontay Johnson is necessarily a lock for huge production in this game, but I still am starting him as a top 10 receiver. CeeDee Lamb, my wide receiver 10, They, uh, him and the Cowboys find themselves in a get right spot this week. Now, when you look at it on paper, the Giants have been pretty good against wide receivers over the course of the season this year, but they have been giving it up recently to wide receivers. And they haven't been as good as they were at the beginning of the season. Evans and Godwin in week 11, both had great games. Palmer and Guyton last week, both had great games. Jalen Waddle in week 13 had a great game as well. So uh, this defense has actually been a lot more susceptible to wide receivers than it might seem. And what you're, you know, whatever app you're using for your fantasy league might tell you. So um, CD lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup. These guys are all uh, guys I'm willing to fire up um, in their own kind of tier of wide receivers. CD lamb is the guy that I'm starting. He is expected to be shadow covered by uh, Aaron Robinson, mostly in the slot. And then James Bradbury on the outside is expected to see a whole lot of Amari Cooper um, wide receiver. 11 for me on the week is Jamar chase. He finally got back on track 
last week catching two touchdowns. And again, in fantasy, we tend to overvalue and overestimate consistency and how important it realistically is. But when you have a guy like Jamar Chase in an offense that does run the ball quite a bit, he's going to be inconsistent here and there. He's going to have games, especially with a receiver like T. Higgins across from him, where T. Higgins gets the majority of the targets, maybe gets the touchdown that week. But Chase is in your lineup each and every week. He has weak winning upside, and he showed that last week in the game. Uh, Jamar Chase expected to see Ronald Darby as his primary matchup in coverage, 57% catch percentage allowed. He's been pretty decent in coverage, but again, Jamar Chase is a good enough wide receiver that it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Mike Evans, I already touched on my wide receiver 12 for the week, closing out the top 12. He has Marshawn Lattimore again this week. As we know, every time they play the New Orleans Saints, we get Marshawn Lattimore versus Mike Evans. We know that Tom Brady doesn't tend to target Mike Evans when he's shadowed, like I already kind of mentioned, versus Lattimore. 17 targets over four games total, three regular season, and the one playoff game. They just don't throw at Marshawn Lattimore, which is smart because the rest of the Saints corners are not very good. You can easily take advantage of them, especially when you have a wide receiver like Chris Godwin against the number two corner like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Uh, but he did beat uh, Marshawn Lattimore last week or last time they played for a long touchdown in week eight, Mike Evans. So even though he doesn't get a whole lot of targets, he could definitely catch a touchdown, could have a big play in this one. Uh, so still put him into your lineup as a top 12 wide receiver. Again, you could maybe argue that he's a little bit too high, but I still tend to think that this game is a game that the Bucks dominate time of possession because Taysom Hill will probably be shut down to some degree. Wide receiver 13, I have as Jalen Waddle right now. Now, as I'm recording this, news just broke that Jalen Waddle is being put on the COVID list, and it is Thursday today. So that definitely is not great news for those of you guys that have Jalen Waddle, because if he tested positive for the virus, he will have to test negative twice before their Sunday game, which doesn't leave him a whole lot of time. If this happened on Monday, you'd have a lot more um, you know, kind of confidence that he's going to be playing in this game. But if he does play, he's obviously a great play going forward because he only has one game since week six with less than eight targets and five of eight games over that stretch with double digit targets. I, I got to say, I, I'm pleasantly surprised with how Jalen Waddle has performed this year. I didn't expect him to command the level of targets he's commanded. I expected a 700 yard, five touchdown type of rookie season where he made some big plays happen and we're excited about him going into the future. But this is a guy that has 114 targets this year. He has been a target machine for a guy that is, you know, not the prototype, uh, you know, target machine type of wide receiver. So definitely ideal for Jalen Waddle. But obviously, if he's not playing in this week, then you guys might be without your number two receiver or your number one receiver, depending on your team. T. Higgins, I already kind of touched on. He has three straight games of 100 yards. It's a tougher matchup this week versus Patrick Sertan, but I have no issues rolling T. Higgins out as a, a high-end wide receiver. Like I said, he is He's got three straight games of 100 yards. He's got like 27 targets over his last three games. This is a guy that you definitely can trust week in and week out. Wide receiver 15, Mike Williams. I already kind of touched on his teammate as well. Wasn't able to do anything last week aside from take James Bradbury out of the equation and let Josh Palmer and Jalen Guyton do the, uh, the heavy lifting in that game. This week, the Chiefs corners present a similar challenge because they have been pretty good this year. But like I already kind of said, uh, Mike Williams went for seven, 122 and two touchdowns back in week three against Kansas City the first time that they played. So maybe Mike Williams is the guy that does the damage in this game and Keenan Allen is limited to some degree. That would make a little bit of sense. So Mike Williams is a guy that I have a little bit higher than I typically would because he did perform against this team back in week three. Uh, Hunter Renfro, my wide receiver 16 on the week. He is currently averaging nine targets per game since week seven. He's failed to command eight plus targets in only one game over that same stretch since week seven. Darren Waller is still not practicing as of Wednesday. I haven't heard today's practice report yet, but if Darren Waller is out again, Hunter Renfro is easily a high end wide receiver too. I might even move him up a little bit. Um, if Hunter, if Darren Waller is for sure out, I can tell you as a Bucks fan that MJ Stewart, who is his primary matchup this week, cannot hang with Hunter Renfro. MJ Stewart's biggest problem in Tampa Bay was athleticism and his ability to hang with shiftier receivers and Hunter Renfro will wipe the floor with him. So if Hunter Renfro has MJ Stewart in coverage with no Darren Waller again on the field, he might be inside my top 12 this week and a guy that I'm absolutely firing up in DFS, in season long, whatever the case is. Now, moving on to wide receiver 17 through 24, getting into the back-end wide receiver two portion of the rankings, we have Amari Cooper. Again, Amari Cooper is a little bit lower this week because he is expected to get the James Bradbury treatment, as mentioned with CeeDee Lamb. Giants defense, though, as I already mentioned too, isn't as scary as the numbers suggest. Cowboys project to dominate time of possession in this game, which is very important. I think people tend to underestimate a little bit. People see a bad offense going up against a good offense while while struggling the Cowboys. And they see that, you know, the the Cowboys defense is, is capable of creating turnovers on the Giants offense. That'll give them more possessions, more scoring opportunities because the Giants offense ranks bottom five in EPA per play and offensive DVOA. And the the Cowboys defense is on a roll right now and is playing really, really well. So there's a good chance that the Cowboys have the ball 
for 35, 37 minutes of this game. And that's going to benefit everybody involved from the receivers to the running backs, whatever the case is, no matter the game script that helps everybody. Cause it just means more offensive plays. And as I mentioned, these are the matchups on the screen, Cooper versus uh, James Bradbury in shadow coverage, CD lamb versus Aaron Robinson in the slot. And then a Dory Jackson, probably likely to see a lot of Michael Gallup on the outside. I think he's probably a pretty good flex option as well. Tyler Lockett, wide receiver 18 for me on the week. He is in a great spot, uh, regardless of how you slice it this week. His matchup currently is Kareem Orr, who I've never even heard of. He hasn't played a whole lot this year. And when he did, which was last week, he got absolutely abused by Brandon Cooks for over 100 yards. So Tyler Lockett in a great spot, no matter what happens with Jalen Ramsey. I think Tyler Lockett is a great uh, start this week. And I kind of can lump my wide receiver 19 in this conversation as well, because it's his teammate, DK Metcalf. And DK Metcalf, as as of now, I like Metcalf as a start, but if Jalen Ramsey is back off the COVID list because he, he you know he did get placed on the COVID list on Saturday or Sunday, right before the um, Rams game uh, with the Cardinals on Monday night, it, they're in intensive protocols right now. There's a whole lot of COVID stuff going on, but if Jalen Ramsey is out, this is where I see DK Metcalf at wide receiver 19 for me. If Jalen Ramsey plays, I expect him to shadow cover DK Metcalf, and that probably bumps him down to the wide receiver 22, 23 type of range for DK Metcalf with how he's been performing recently. Wide receiver 20, Marquise Brown is really going to depend on how Lamar Jackson uh, goes, right? Because Lamar Jackson, as it stands right now, the most recent update that we have today is that it's going to go down to the wire. And he's like a true game time decision, day to day, whatever the case is. If Lamar plays, which is kind of my expectation right now, but again, I don't really know at this point, the targets have been there for Hollywood Brown. He hasn't scored in five games, which is why he hasn't been performing very well. And he also hasn't exceeded 55 receiving yards in four games, despite seeing 13, 10, seven, and eight targets during that span. So he's kind of like a positive regression candidate. I've kind of been talking about him for a couple, uh, a couple games now as a guy that should be performing a little bit better than he is. Marquise Brown does see Eric Stokes in coverage this week. Who's been playing pretty well in his rookie season. And, and more importantly, also has the speed to keep up with a guy like Marquise Brown downfield. So if Lamar Jackson plays, I'm firing up Marquise Brown, probably going to bump him up around wide receiver 15 or so. But if uh, Lamar Jackson is out, I probably move Marquise Brown down to about 23, 24, where um, Tyler Huntley definitely takes an impact into his overall ceiling. Number 21, we have Cordero Patterson, who I talked about yesterday. The 49ers have a banged up secondary, so I expect Patterson to be able to contribute through the air. But as I talked about yesterday, again, this dude is extremely volatile. He doesn't play 50% or more of the snaps in the, you know, in the past couple of weeks, really. This is a guy that really needs design touches and to create a whole lot on his own because his offense is bad and he's not getting the usage that you want to see out of like a true weapon type that he's being used as. So as a wide receiver too, I'm okay starting him, but not a guy that I'm going to be putting over some of these solidified number one wide receivers like DK Metcalf, like uh, Marquise Brown and some of the other guys that I already talked about. Terry McLaurin, uh, wide receiver 22 for me right now. And it's mainly due to the concussion. Uh, he'd be a little bit higher for me, obviously, if I knew he was playing. He didn't practice yesterday, still in the concussion protocol. So he definitely could miss this week. Concussions are always finicky. You never know how long a player is going to be out. Um, if he's going to miss a game, if he's going to miss three games, you know, perfect example of that is JD McKissick. I thought he'd probably be back one week after getting his concussion. He ended up missing two games. Uh, if Terry McLaurin does get healthy, though, he's going to get a healthy dose of Darius Slay. So uh, even if he plays, it's not a great matchup for him. So not a guy that I think is a locked and loaded start by any means, but a guy that I think you probably need to start if he does play for your team, because you probably won't have that many better options. Number 23, Brandon Cooks uh, saw a big time impact and a big time uptick in his target volume with Davis Mills back as the starting quarterback in games where Davis Mills has started. Brandon Cooks is averaging 9.67 targets per game, which is a very, very good number compared to 7.3 targets per game, which is fine. But in an offense like the Texans, you really need that elite volume because his floor from an efficiency standpoint is very low. He could have a 14 target game and only catch five of them because of his quarterback and his offense. That's definitely possible for Brandon Cooks, but that target volume is there for him. And if Davis can have a decent day, then I think you're usually golden for uh, Brandon Cooks starts. As you guys can see on the screen, he is expected to see Shaquille Griffin in coverage, who's allowed a 69% catch percentage, uh, has uh, you know a decent PFF grade this season, but a guy that I think Brandon Cooks should be able to uh, get a little bit done on, probably not a huge game for Brandon Cooks, but nonetheless, I think uh, this is a pretty good spot for him. Number 24, final wide receiver of the top 24 is DJ Moore. However you slice it, he doesn't have a great matchup this week. What What's the expectation, right? With this offense, with this Carolina Panthers team, if Cam Newton is starting, if Sam Darnold is starting, who's been activated off IR, what is the realistic expectation in terms of passing yardage for this offense? Because 150, 200 yards is pretty much what we've seen out of Cam Newton. And same goes for Sam Darnold before he start, uh, suffered his injury. So at the low 
passing production that you're going to see out of the Carolina Panthers against a defense like Buffalo, even without Tredavious White, this defense is way easier to run on than they are to pass on. I don't think DJ Moore is going to be very valuable this week in fantasy. He definitely could catch a touchdown, which is why I still have him in this range, but I think his ceiling on the week is like six catches, 55 yards and a touchdown. I don't think he's going to have like a 120 yard game for an offense that typically only produces like 150, 180 passing yards. You got to figure the running backs are going to be involved a little bit. You got to figure Robbie Anderson's going to catch a pass or two, maybe three. You got to figure that, um, you know, other contributors are going to catch a pass here and there. And DJ Moore just can't, you know, soak up 80% of the passing production for this Panthers offense. Cause that'd be kind of unrealistic to uh, expect out of him. So I'm going to speed through these 25 through 32 a little bit faster just because, you know, they uh, they have a little bit more question marks and I don't want this video to go too long. But again, if I don't talk about a receiver that you are looking for, if you're looking for, you know, AJ Green versus Nico Collins or something this week, just go to the rankings. You will see the answer to that in the rankings. So if you have any questions regarding wide receivers, uh, also comment them down below and I'll do my best to help you out or just check the rankings for sure. Number 25 is Devontae Smith. He's definitely seen inconsistent target totals this year, but when you look at his target share, he is a 24% target share on the season. So that is the number that matters. In my opinion, they just don't throw the ball a whole lot in Philadelphia. Two weeks ago, we saw Dallas Goddard have the huge game and Devonte Smith definitely disappoint when Gardner Minshew was starting, but Devonte Smith has uh Kendall Fuller in coverage. Who's allowing a 67% catch percentage despite his good PFF grade on the season. So I do like Devonte Smith as a bit of a bounce back candidate this week. Number 26, Brandon Ayuk already kind of mentioned him should see a decent amount of AJ Terrell this week, but still is a high end wide receiver three, given the target totals that we've seen out of him the past couple of weeks. Darnell Mooney was very solid up until last week and the week before that, where he hasn't really seen um, the high end production, but Justin Fields is playing a little bit better. Plus this is a much easier matchup than the green Bay Packers who we went up against last week. The Vikings are just giving it away to wide receivers right now. He has about a 30 point advantage in terms of his PFF grade versus Mackenzie Alexander, who is his primary matchup in coverage this week. So I do like Darnell Mooney as a guy that probably surprises some people this week. Michael Pittman Jr. I talked about on Tuesday. However you slice it, the matchup isn't great for him as well. Uh, Michael Pittman Jr. is expected to see JC Jackson in shadow coverage, who has been very, very good this year in shadow coverage as well. Been holding a lot of better receivers than Michael Pittman Jr. to poor stat lines. So if you don't have to start Michael Pittman Jr. this week, I wouldn't because I don't think he's a locked and loaded start especially with how much this team runs the ball and how slow of an offense that they run. Number 29, Chase Claypool. He has seen his routes actually decline in recent weeks in favor of Ray Ray McLeod. Now it could be a maturity thing, could be, you know, whatever the case is, Chase Claypool is not on the field as much as you want him to be. So he is a boomer bust wide receiver three going forward. There's nothing really else to talk about with him. He hasn't exceeded 70% of the routes in three games now. So uh, Chase Claypool against Christian Fulton and Buster Screen, both of those guys have played pretty well this season. So I'm not rushing to char- uh, to start Chase Claypool this week either. Number 30 is uh, uh, Van Jefferson, and number 32 is Odell Beckham Jr. So again, we don't know if Odell Beckham Jr. is going to play in this game. If he is out, then Van Jefferson would find himself around wide receiver 20 or so ahead of guys like Terry McLaurin and DJ Moore. Either way, though, when you look at the matchups, it looks like a game where Cooper Cup is going to steal all the production. It looks like a game where Cooper Cup goes off and you're left feeling a little disappointed with Van Jefferson or Odell Beckham Jr. So regardless, um, I think Odell Beckham Jr. being out obviously helps Van Jefferson, but I'm not starting Van Jefferson over some other great options. And then finally, I talked about 30 and 32 already. Christian Kirk is my wide receiver 31 on the week. I have him the highest among Arizona Cardinals wide receivers because we've seen Christian Kirk get decent usage with Hopkins out of the lineup. But what we haven't seen is Kyler Murray also be on the field because every game we've seen with Christian Kirk without Hopkins, Kyler Murray was also out. We saw him with Colt McCoy. So the fact that Kyler Murray is on the field and DeAndre Hopkins is now out for the season, I really like the big play upside with a guy like Christian Kirk. And I also think AJ Green is a decent start as well. Rondell Moore, a decent desperation play, especially against this matchup against the Detroit Lions where Christian Kirk is expected to see Amani or Awarie, AJ Green against the Kel Roby Coleman. I think these guys can do some damage in the passing game. So if you guys did enjoy that video, as always, hit the like button, comment any of your thoughts down below, subscribe to the channel if you are new, if you want to become a member, go to the YouTube page, Fantasy Stock Exchange, and hit that join button. You'll get a bunch of perks, priority response to comments. You will get uh, badges, emojis, et cetera. We're also going to be running you know, members-only live streams at some point in the off-season once we have some members, as well as uh, members-only polls. If you guys want to vote on future videos and you know some of the content that we make, that gives you some voting power as well. Peace out, guys, and I'll talk to you soon.